Does it work? Uh, not yet. I'll, I'll have to work on it. I, but I won't have time right now. But it shouldn't be a problem, I think. Just <coughs> okay, guys. <coughs> Can everyone see? Yeah. Yeah? Let's turn off a little bit more lights. <coughs> so today we begin to introduce the idea of simulation. And uh, for now, we're, we're going to focus our attention on gazebo, but we're going to go slowly. There's a lot of things for us to learn, okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you know, uh, let's start with the motivation. Running experiments with uh, real robots can be difficult for many reasons. Setting up a complex uh, robot can take a lot of time. You have to start a lot of files, a lot of nodes, got to take care of the physical uh, environment. Got to get the robot ready to start. It could take you 10 minutes, 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes just to get started. Yeah, in the right way. It depends on the complexity of the task. Sometimes you may be using more than one computer. So either one person is moving around, setting up all the computers, or you have a team uh, of people saying, this is ready, this is ready, this is ready, or just checking. And to make all of that work very seamlessly, it takes a lot of work. And that may be just for one experiment. If you want the robot to be very robust, very general, very flexible, it just takes even more work. Yeah? Uh, robots can be fragile. Fragile, that means they can break easily. If you make a mistake, hit a table. Things can break, uh, a, a motor can break, the, a physical part of the robot can break. <clears throat> like some of you guys have been doing force control and get a little bit scared when you have to work with the real robot, right? And I showed you some, some experiments with, if, if you have a controller and it's not stable, the robot can start to do things like this and hit something. Yeah, so they're fragile and they're expensive. So if you break anything, the, the cost of that, the pain, the difficulty, is really big. So there's a lot of motivation to use simulation. Simulations can run quickly. Yeah? You can change them uh, much faster than you can a real physical robot. Most of the time, not always. Yeah? If you break anything, it's free. You just start it again and run it. Okay? Now, good simulators, this is important. Good simulators require no change of code from software to hardware. Yeah? That's a good simulator because you can run the same code. And for the longest time, this was not possible. It was really difficult to get a simulator and a real robot to run exactly the same way. And with ROS, this can be done uh, seamlessly for, for many, many robots. Exactly the same code can run for software and hardware. You may not appreciate that because you have not experienced the pain, but that's very valuable, yeah? And uh, simulators, you have simulators that uh, run with physics engines. Physics engines. There are simulators that run without physics engines. Uh, the simulators that run with physics engines resemble the real world, yeah? Uh, you can resemble sensors. Not perfectly, but similarly. You can resemble actuators. You can resemble the forces and the moments that happen when you make contact between a robot and an object or a surface. Yeah, you can experience gravity. You can experience acceleration. You can experience forces. That's what a physics engine lets you do. Okay? You can feel weight and mass and uh, momentum, okay? So Russ is really well suited for this. Uh, just to introduce the idea of a simulation, we can start with a very simple 2D environment of a robot. Yeah, there's no physics engines here. This is an example of a maze or a map. And uh, there's a, a package called 2D Robot Simulator, or STDR. You can click on that. And you need to download it using sudo apt install ros indigo stdr simulator. 
Once you download it, you can just easily run it by saying host launch, stdr launchers, server with map and GUI plus robot.launch. Okay, so let's do that real quick. And you do it with me, download it, and then run it. And let's take a look at it. Okay. Lost launch, STDR, launchers, server with map and GUI plus robot. So you do that. You have you have the PPT. You can look at it in your own computer. Yeah. And so here's here's the simulation. All right. <coughs> Some of the things we can see right here is that the robot contains a LiDAR. LiDAR is like uh, something that combines light with a sonar. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> on the red color, you see the LiDAR. Yeah, it's a, a ray of light that goes away from the robot. And any time it hits uh, a reflective surface, then that ray can come back and you can have an idea of the distance of that surface. Some surfaces like glass or shiny metal or this floor, for example, those are surfaces that don't reflect very well, Yeah, depending on the angle as well. So the, the, the light ray might hit a window and not bounce back, just keep going or go somewhere else. So you get bad information from that. It works best with walls and, and hard surfaces. Yeah, the, the green uh, uh, color is, I think, for sonar. Yeah, now both of these sensors have some limitations. They can't go on forever. Maybe they can measure distances within a range. That could be one meter, two meters, 10 meters, depending on the sensor. So if you hit a surface within that limit, it can go back. You also have a field of view for all sensors. For example, you have a span of about 30, 40 degrees here. The sensor may not be able to measure 365 degrees, 180 degrees. Uh, I can find a package for the rules via STO Are you new to our class? Have you been coming every week? Uh, I, I can come here last week. Uh, so it depends how you, if you have set your ROS, uh, your ROS server address and ROS keys correctly should be able to find it. I don't know if you have done that. Um, yeah, that I cannot help you with that just now. I can help you that in a break. Yeah. <coughs> and so, any, any this is a mobile robot, and by default in ROS we can move mobile robots by commanding a twist. Do you guys remember what a twist is? You should know very well. What is a twist? I see these kind of faces like. Quick. No. No. That's a wrench. What? What kind of message? What kind of vector? Oh, come on, guys. Well, it's right here. Linear velocity and angular velocity. Twist oh, is yeah, about yeah, velocity. Yeah. Linear velocity, angular velocity. So you can move straight, x, y, z, or you can rotate x, y, z. Yeah. Now, you're a mobile robot. You cannot rotate x. You cannot rotate y. Uh, which x is like this, and y is like this. You can just rotate z Okay, for a standard mobile robot. Uh, so once we, once we uh, start the simulator, we can see everything that this little 2D robot is going to do. So you can say robot ROS topic list, right? And you can see there's a lot of things being uh, published here. Yeah, this, this one is very interesting to, um, to us, the command velocity. The command velocity topic is where you command the velocity. You command the robot how to move using a twist. Yeah, and then the other one that's gonna be very interesting is this one, the odometry. The odometry is a, is how the robot is moving with respect to the world. With respect to the world. And you can combine simple or advanced techniques. 
here to compute the final odometry. Yeah? So for example, if you say uh, Ross topic <coughs> type, robot zero uh, command velocity, you get that geometry messages twist, okay? And then if you want to see it, you pipe that Ross message show. Yeah, and so here's your linear 3D velocity and your angular 3D velocity, okay? For the odometry, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. This is navigation messages odometry, okay? And let's look at what that looks like. Last message show. You have a position, you have a pose, position and orientation, right? Where is the robot? X, Y, Z, what is the orientation? Then you have uh, covariance because there's a measure of error yeah, of the sensors. And then you also get a, a twist on that, how fast is the robot moving? But this is the robot motion, not the command, right? <coughs> uh, so that's the odometry, okay? Let's go back here. <coughs> the sensor data from the LiDAR and the sonar can help us to localize. SLAM means simultaneous localization and mapping. Localization is where am I in the map, yeah? When you, look at, when you look at this simulation, where is the robot? If this is uh, zero, zero, right? So you have some distance x, some distance y. And SLAM or localization is about how can the robot know where it is at the beginning? Okay, and then you use that also to avoid collisions, right? You don't want to hit the wall, you don't want to hit other things that are moving. <clears throat> so now we're going to command the robot to uh, move. Uh, by sending a command to command velocity. Okay, so I showed you that. <coughs> so here manually we can command a velocity using Rust Topic Pub, right? Rust Topic Pub, the first thing that you do here is you take a rate. So this is going to be two times per second. Then we have the topic, robot zero command velocity. Then we have the type of the topic, geometry messages twist. Yeah, and then we need to supply the data. This is a little bit more complicated. You need to learn this syntax. Start and finish with quotes. Then start and finish with curly brackets, right? And then you have the linear component and you have the angular component. After each component, you need a colon. So linear colon or angular colon. And then that has a substructure x, y, z, right? So you have x colon and here, pay attention, space, space, space. Space. You need a space. If you don't include a space after the colon, it won't work. Okay, so the syntax is important. Move in the x direction, forward, 0 0.5 meters per second. Zero in the y, zero in the z, cannot move up. Yeah, <clears throat> and then angular, cannot rotate like this, cannot rotate like this. And here, this is this kind of rotation, we set it to zero. So if we do that, uh, you can move. So let's go here, let's move this to the side, let's bring this over on this side. So you can say uh, Ross Topic Pub, rate of two, uh, robot zero, command velocity, uh, geometry, messages, twist, twist, <coughs> quotes, curly brackets, linear, colon space, yeah, <coughs> x, 0 0.5. Actually, if you only want to send one command, you can just stop there. Everything else will be zero by default. Yeah, so you press enter, and the robot begins to move. Okay? So right now, the robot is getting this command. That command goes into the PID controller. The PID controller sends the command to the wheels, begins to move, and then here, it hits the wall. Okay? <clears throat> if you want to move it back, you press control C, just change that to a negative number, and it'll go back. You see the sensors reflect the shape of the, of the map, okay? You can also, if you want to stop, uh, you can publish zero, zero, or even an empty message completely, okay? So ROS makes it very easy to handle a, a robot, okay? Then we can do the same thing using C++ code, yeah? <coughs> Let's look at this CPP file. Uh, there are going to be ROS headers. We'll be publishing the command, which is a twist. We need to set those va uh, values or parameters. Uh, setting some parameters, filling the twist message, and then publishing with some 
hard code loops. So here what the roller will do is like go straight and then go left. Very simple code. Uh, this one is in part two. So let's see. We can come back here and say Ross Ed. And is it part two? No. Let's see. Let's let me open this code real quick. Remember where what I should have put a Ross Ed command there. This is oh STDR control. Okay. So we go to STDR control and then STDR open loop dot CPP. So here's our code. Let's take a look at that super quick. <coughs> of course, ROS.h, and then because we need to publish a twist, right? Geometry messages twist.h. We need to define that we need a definition for the ROS message. This is a geometry message twist.h. If you feel confused, you need to remember, I need to become familiar with types. Yeah, and then know which one to include. So we init the node, we create the node handle, and here we have the publisher. We're gonna publish a geometry messages twist. This is our topic, and then we have a queue of one. Here's some parameters, uh, the delta t, the time that we're gonna use for this math, 0.01 seconds. We want the robot to move at one meter per second. We want the robot to rotate at 0.5 radians per second. Remember that in ROS, all the units are standard units. Meters, seconds, radians, okay? And then some, some threshold uh, for moving three meters, something like that. So then, because we have that dot H uh, header here, we can just set everything to zero. <coughs> Uh, first, we need to sorry, we need to create the the variable, right? Geometry messages scope operator twist. Then you give any name you want. We're going to call it twist command. Once we have twist command, you can access the linear and the angular parts of that message. Both of these have x, y, z, right? And then you set them to zero. Okay. So in terms of rates, we le we learned that before. We have we create this variable loop time timer. And this is going to be 1 over delta t. Delta t is 0.01, so the rate is 100 hertz. Okay? And then start the time, a timer at 0 here. And this is just a hard-coded for loop. So we're going to do this 10 times. We're going to publish the twist command. At the beginning is 0. And then uh, we're going to, to sleep <coughs> uh, to make this uh, 100 hertz. So right now, uh, the robot will not move, right? Everything is zero and we're not changing anything. After that, uh, we change uh, that message to speed. Speed, we set up here to be uh, one meter per second. Yep. And so while timer is less than three seconds, publish the twist. So this is, uh, let me see. This is uh, setting the linear dot x part of that twist message. So it's going to move forward one meter per second. It's going to do it for three seconds because we're publishing. Yeah, we increase the time by 0 0.01 every time and uh, eventually it will stop. So this is just a hard coded way to say move forward 1.0, publish, increase the time, control the, the for loop rate and that, or the while loop rate and then come back. Yeah? Uh, because we want to run uh, until three seconds has passed. Until three seconds has passed. Then we stop the robot. Now we make it rotate. We set angular.z equals yaw rate. Again, we set the timer, same while loop. We're going to publish that twist, only has a rotation. Increase the time, control the rate of the loop. And then uh, set both to zero and publish that. So, you know, you have the code. Make sure you run cat can make. Once you have that code, then we can run this. Yeah, let's uh, look at our simulator. And uh, actually, let me move that robot back a little bit so it's at the beginning where it used to be. Maybe I'm going to mess this up because it's in a different location. But now we can say rush run. 
Rush run this one. I think should be this one. Yep, this one. Uh, we also need Rust core. Uh, no, we don't need Rust core. We have that. So we run that. <coughs> and there it goes, moving forward one meter per second, three seconds, and it rotates. And then goes again, something like that. Hard coded way to do. It. All right? <coughs> All right. So let's go back here, full screen. <coughs> Oh, what happened? Okay, so of course more intelligent approaches can be used. Uh, we have another book in the class called Ross by Example, book number one, book number two. Book number one uh, also gives you a nice slam overview, and then book number two gives you kind of pretty advanced examples, charging velocity, moving autonomously, using state machines. So you can look at that if you want to learn more. <coughs> Uh, but even something as simple as this can be useful for simple sensor-based behaviors. Very simple sensor-based behavior. I have a student, he's looking for a job uh, at DoraBot in Shenzhen. They use a lot of ROS. They asked him a question about, hey, how can you uh, f navigate through this map? Give me your answer in 30 minutes. He freaked out. He didn't do it. <coughs> uh, <coughs> You can do a lot of things with simple sensor-based behaviors to navigate. That could give you a job at Dorobot if you know how to do this. Okay? <coughs> Here we don't have any sensor noise, so that means that sensor information that you get is perfect. <coughs> but you also don't have uh, realistic vehicle dynamics. This word can often confuse students. Dynamics. What does that mean? What's well, the way in which a robot can move? Especially things related to, to physics. So the robot has inertia, right? You go, you start accelerating, and then if you stop moving, the robot still wants to move, right? So you have to apply brakes or something, same for an arm. Those things affect the motion of the robot. You have angular inertia, that has to do with rotations, right? <coughs> Actuator saturation. Saturation here means, let's say that you want the, just like this, EV, stand up. Now, I want you to put your hand back here. Don't move. Yeah, just put your hand, touch my hand. Touch my hand back here. More, more, more. Higher, higher, higher. <laughs> That's saturation right here. You can't move more because oh. you reach your limit. Mm -hmm. Motors have limits. When they reach the limit, they saturate. Yeah? <clears throat> Everything has a limit. Yeah, you cannot go further back than this. This is actuator saturation right here. <clears throat> you have friction. They're motors, they're metal, right? They need oil inside, there's friction. They get hot, uh, servo controller, the controller response cannot be perfect. KID controller, you see, some of you guys have been doing KID controllers, you see that they're not perfect or yeah. have mistakes. The response affects the dynamics. If you have a, a, a car, a mobile robot, the wheels can slip, slip on the floor. They rotate, but the car didn't move because they slip, sometimes they slip, depending on the terrain. Uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> here we, we can just look at, we call it the dynamic response, although the only thing we're going to look here is at the twist. We can look at the dynamic response using RQT plot. Yeah, this is a Ross, uh, oh, and uh, Ross standard is to publish the robot's linear and angular velocity as odometry. So when we use RQT plot, we can look at the odometry topic and pay attention to the twist part of the odometry topic. So let's uh, go back to here. <coughs> I still have my simulator. Uh, let me start it again from the beginning. And let me open one more here. I'm going to take this off, put it over here. Let me close this. Um, we're going to do this on this one. Yeah, and uh, we're going to do the, the simulator here. And we're going to say RQT plot, robot zero. Uh, let me see, this still doesn't exist. Let's start the simulator. Move it here. <coughs> robot zero odometry. Yeah, twist. Uh, 
just be one. I think here I have two twists. That's wrong. Angular Z. You can always add the you can always add the signal uh, uh, directly here on the panel. Okay, let's run this node and then let's let's see this response. And so this this blue one is uh, oh this is showing the position, not the angular response. Oh, maybe I do need two twists. <coughs> Uh, can I reset this guy? Reset. This is to load the map. Different, different properties. Maybe I'll start it again, and then let's do two twists here. Twist. Okay. Start that. Start this. <coughs> and oh, I still didn't get it. <coughs> Robot zero. Oh, let's see. Post topic list, robot zero, odometry, yeah, and then ROS topic, ROS message show, nav messages, odometry, no, nope, not this one, ROS topic. Oh, sorry, need to do it from the beginning. ROS topic type, robot zero. DOM, post message, show, odometry, <coughs> twist, twist, oh, twist, twist, angular, okay, <coughs> twist, twist, oh, that's what we did, right, Rodham's, twist, twist, angular Z, there it is. <coughs> Any little uh, mistake can can see. So this this is just a you see the rotation there and the rotation back. Very simple, but uh, <coughs> you know you can look at more advanced things with uh, this visualization. <coughs> okay, more sophisticated robots need a detailed robot model. We need to explain the geometry, and ROS will en enable to model very very complex robots that have hundreds of parts. This doesn't mean the files are simple. The files can be very complicated as well. But you can model the geometry, you can model the mass properties, very important. If you want to be able to simulate dynamics, you need to know if I have a robot link, how heavy is it? What are the inertial properties, the rotation of inertia of the, of the link? How does it behave? Uh, is there friction? Uh, what are some different kinds of parameters? You have surface contact properties, uh, talking about friction, Coulomb friction, or other kinds of friction. And then you have actuator dynamics, uh, something like transmissions and other things like this. All of this can be specified in a file called Unified Robot Description File uh, Format, URDF, okay? So this is gonna be a really important file for you. We're gonna look at a lot of it. In the URDF, <coughs> for physically realistic dynamic simulations, we're going to need four models that we need to work on. Dynamic model, mass and uh, inertia properties, collision model, how <coughs> does the, the system know when two links touch to make a collision. Visual model, just how do things look? What is their color and their texture? Kinematic model is about kinematics, forward kinematics type stuff. How many links do you have? What are their connections? What is the direction of the joints? How do they move? Things like that. So these four things are included in a URDF file. Okay? <coughs> okay, so I mentioned that, inertial properties. Let me jump here, <coughs> collisions. In physics engines, you can have different kinds of engines. For example, Gazebo has all of these. Open dynamics engine, sorry that doesn't look good. ODE, bullet, dark, symbolic. Different engines have different uh, strengths and weaknesses. <coughs> yeah, uh, this one uh, uses like ordinary differential equations. This one uses conservation of momentum. This one is, is okay, works well for short duration contact, but not well for long duration contact. 
things like that. So you, if, if you care a lot about these things, you need to have a good insight about how the engine works and which one might be better for you. And people always continue to improve uh, how these things work. Uh, <coughs> in this class, we're going to use Gazebo 2, but uh, these days you can also use Gazebo 8. The problem is uh, it takes a lot of work to create models, right? So updating them and porting them to the latest edition is not easy. It requires a lot of work. If anyone wants to do it, the whole world will be happy to take your work in and, and use it, but it just takes a lot of work. So normally the robot models will lag behind the latest simulation editions. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so visual models for graphical display. Many, many times the visual model and the collision model will be the same. Uh, <clears throat> will be the same. And we'll explain more of, of this in a second. Uh, in the collision model, we also can talk about friction and resilience, color, reflectivity, transparency, we mentioned that. So let's look at an example here. Now, we're not going to start with a URDF file. We're going to start with another file called SDF, uh, which is similar to the URDF, uh, and it's uh, originally designed to work with Gazebo. So we'll talk about it in a second. So we'll open this file from package example models. We're going to look at this rectangular prism. Okay, so we can open it like this. The, UN, the SDF and the URDF both use XML. XML is a, a, how can I describe it? Not a system, but a style of encoding information using tags. It looks a little bit like HTML if you have background with HTML. So XML is going to be used for SDF and URDF. And then right now, we're start with inertial, collision, and visual. <coughs> no uh, kinematic model as an example. Then we will add kinematic, the kinematic model, and we'll look at more complicated things. So let's open this file with me. <coughs> Ross said example models, model um, 1.4.sdf. One point four is the one uh, one underscore four dot is the right. Uh, I put a point there. <coughs> oh, there's many of these here. Uh, let's see, we're doing starting pen, uh, number two. And then uh, let's see. Okay, let's look at this very quickly. So, anytime that something like this, uh, you have something that starts and finishes with this, these are called tags. Okay? Tags. And these will always start by saying this is an XML something something. For SDF, uh, you set the version. Uh, here we're using 1.4. And then every model has a name. We're going to start with rectangular. Uh, we're going to give this uh, this model the name rectangular prism. Okay. Then uh, you'll see that we have the three categories that we mentioned. Here we have uh, uh, a link, which uh, sorry. Here we have the inertial tag that is going to belong to this link. In a second, we'll look at the collision tag, and finally we'll look at the visual tag. Okay. So we have uh, these, these four things right here. So we have a link. A link means maybe like this upper arm or this lower arm. Okay, that's a link. And we're going to give a mass. This is just an example. In kilograms, 2,000 kilograms. And then this is a rotation of inertia. We're going to talk in more detail later. Uh, we need six numbers here to describe that. It's a matrix of 12, but six numbers are enough to describe it. Then uh, we need the collision model. It has a name, and then it has a geometry. Uh, here we have a box of two by two by four. And this uh, collision model will be similar to the visual model, which also has a geometry, a box, and a two by two by four. Okay, this is just an example. Show it really quickly to you. Let's move uh, slowly through, through the next part. Okay. 
Uh, we're going to uh, look at a robot description called Minimal Example. It's a one degree of freedom robot. Yeah, so it can rotate in one direction. It's a one degree of freedom. <coughs> then for your homework, we're gonna, you're going to do the detailed example for a two degree of freedom arm. Okay, and the link is here. So you can click there and go to this tutorial. And uh, so now we're going to open up this uh, links and joints URDF and minimal robot description. So we can say raw set, minimal robot description, links and joints. Yeah, just like this. Wind is falling asleep. I'm sorry, wind. Yeah, <clears throat> so let's take a look here. And so we're going to look at this file, but let me then introduce some sections here. The kinematic model. <clears throat> the kinematic model uh, will be a minimal requirement to model a robot. It will describe links and joints in general. Links and joints. Yeah. For example, in this diagram, you have one link here, one link here, and then you have a joint that connects them. Right? If you haven't taken a manipulation class, it's just like you have your upper arm, your lower arm, but your elbow is a link. Right? And so it helps you to, to know how this can move. Yeah? The shoulder is a little bit different. In the shoulder we have three link, uh, three joints. Yeah, we have this we can think of the torso as a link and the upper arm, but then we can go up and down, and then we can go left and right, and then we can even rotate like this. Yeah, so there's three joints here. But all together, so it's a really special, uh, we call it a spherical joint, the very special joint we have on the shoulder. <coughs> in this example, we're going to have two links and one joint, and it describes an open chain. An open chain is something that has a beginning and an end, yeah? Different from a closed chain. A closed chain might have this, this, then another joint here, another link here, another joint here, and another link here. For example, this is an open chain, this arm. This is an open chain, but when I put my hands together, I create a closed chain. And now my motion is different, right? It can do this, but it cannot do this, right? So that's a closed chain. In the URDF, we, we have a limitation to open chains. It won't work with closed chains. <coughs> Links and joints are the minimal requirements for the robot definition. And then, <coughs> let's focus on the links, okay? Now, each link can only have one parent link. So what does that mean? This is the child. This can only have one parent link, okay? Uh, I, I need to think about this. We can model like a humanoid robot here. And say, for example, the legs. You have the right leg, the left leg, both of, them, both of them connect here, but maybe these are treated as separate things. In general, each link has one parent link, and it has one rigid reference frame. So first we say we have a reference frame here. One reference frame. For this link, it's here. For this link, it's here. We say that it's rigid because, let's say that the reference frame is here. When the arm rotates, this link doesn't move. It stays here. Yeah? It doesn't fly somewhere else. <coughs> so it's rigid. Now, pay attention. The link frame may or not be located within the physical link body. Sometimes this reference frame could be here, even though the link is here. Sometimes. It depends on how you want to describe the system. This, ha this often happens if we compute forward kinematics using Denevit Hardenberg parameters, the edge parameters, okay? Because we have some rules about how to put things together. <coughs> uh, for child frames like this one, the reference frame is usually going to be, not usually, it's always going to be the reference frame of the joint. Yeah? For child links, you look at the joint, and whatever the reference frame is there, that's the reference frame of this child. This is the base link. Not, that's, uh, not just the parent, but the base for the first link anywhere. 
The reference frame is going to be defined by the CAD system, by the computer aided design system. You guys often use SolidWorks. <clears throat> when you create the base link in SolidWorks, you have to say, where is this frame of reference going to be? And you can put it anywhere. Yeah, you gotta find one that makes sense to you. <coughs> the joint frame uh, will be belong both to the channel link, but also to the joint of the system, right? The joint is gonna help the links rotate. This joint has a frame of reference here, but it also has an axis of rotation. And we'll see how we can define that as well. Right now, for example, uh, you could think this is the y-axis, so it means this link could go uh, rotate this way. If this link was pointing in this direction, then it would mean that the link can do something like this. So you also have a joint axis that determines the style of the rotation. Like with this elbow, we can do this, but we cannot move like this, right? I would have to rotate my arm to be able to do that. So those, those, the joint axis uh, defines, that's the kinematic model, it defines how the robot can move. <coughs> When you look at uh, Ross URDF tutorials, they're normally going to use nine fixed parameters and one join variable to describe things. Uh, they don't use uh, a DH parameter representation that is commonly taught in classes. <coughs> if we use uh, DH parameter representation, if you remember from the class, we end up just using three fixed parameters and one joint variable. Okay, just something to keep in mind. This video is a video for DH parameters. You, some of you have seen it before, uh, others have not. It's just as an example to show you what DH parameters are. We're not going to study that right now, okay? Now let's go back to this kinematic model. <coughs> well, let me see, uh, here we go. <coughs> So let's uh, uh, notice that, for example, we create, uh, this is a comment. Comments in XML always start with exclamation mark dash dash and finish with dash dash. If you don't have that, it's not a comment. So we're going to say, let's create this a base link. You just know that. Uh, and so you say, I have a link, and the name is link1. And then we have a, the distal link, the one that is further away, we're going to call it link2. Then. Uh, we're going to create the join, joint axes and the joint frame. This uh, element will have the name joint1 and here in type you can have fixed or continuous. Continuous means you can rotate. Fixed means you cannot rotate. Okay? And here you establish who is the parent and who is the child. The next two things that you need to do for the joint frame is establish the origin, the axes, and establish, uh, sorry, the origin of the frame and the direction of the axes. So if I go back to this diagram, and you look at this value, uh, origin, zero, zero, 001, right? So you come here and you say, this is the x-axis over here, or let's say this is the x-axis and the y-axis and the z-axis. So if I say, let's put the frame at 0, 0, 001, it means for the, for the joint. Let's not move anywhere in the x direction. Let's not move anywhere in the y direction. Let's move up one meter in the z direction. So you move up, and that frame will be parallel to this uh, base frame, will be parallel, and we put it here. Then we look at the uh, rotation. Do I need to rotate by the x? or by the Y, or by the Z. In this example, we have no rotation. So we have roll, pitch, yaw, X, Y, Z, zero, zero, zero. So we just translate the frame up by one meter. And then we say that we want the axis of rotation, X, Y, Z, to point in the Y direction. Zero, one, zero. <clears throat> it means, look at, imagine, uh, look at this, blue cylinder, right? This blue cylinder uh, ha has 
his, its axes of rotation pointing in, let's say this is a y direction. Yeah, which means that the child link can rotate like this. Yeah, if the y direction is in this direction. If the x direction was pointing in this direction, that blue cylinder would be rotated like this. The x direction is coming out this way. And then this child link would rotate like this. Yeah? Does that make sense? So this is a kinematic model, and this file that we see here is the minimal description. Two, two links, one joint. Yeah? We have a reference frame <coughs> for link one. If we don't, uh, established by the CAT system, and that's, that's going to be our zero, zero, zero. Then <coughs> link two has a frame. That frame of reference is defined by the joint frame, which is shifted from the base by a translation, zero, zero, one. And then the joint axis is pointing along the world's y direction. Okay. <coughs> so there's uh, <coughs> there's a command called check URDF that can quickly uh, let us see what the file looks like. <coughs> So for example, here, um, <coughs> uh, let me go back to the other one. Look what happened here. <coughs> so we can say Rust CD uh, minimal description, minimal robot description. And then we can say check URDF. And we put the, the name of the file, which for us is what? Minimal, minimal robot description. Dot URDF. Yeah. And so what you get here is robot name is, oh, I'm using the wrong file, links and joints. Robot name is one, deg one degree of freedom robot. And then it says I can parse the XML. It means I can go through it. It makes sense to me. It says the root link is link one. It has one child. And the name of the first child is link two. Yeah, so it's a tool that just helps you understand the URDF. <coughs> okay, let's look at the visual model. So we have a new file. Uh, one link description.urdf, and this one has uh, the one link description. This one has a little bit more stuff in it. <coughs> it's the same file as before, but we're adding a little bit to it. <coughs> now uh, we're going to add uh, another link. We're going to call it world. World. Okay, so we have that link. And then <coughs> we quickly introduce another joint. And here the name is glue robot to world, type fixed. This means is we're, we're gonna create a link that is the reference frame for the world. It will never move, it will be zero, zero, zero. And we want to put the robot link one, the parent, connected to that world frame. It's gonna be fixed, so there can be no motion between them. Yeah, so we say that, <coughs> and so we say the parent link is world, and the child link is link one. So we do that part. Now we come to the base link, <coughs> and we have to give it a name, so we say link name equals link one. Then we have the visual field. In the visual field, <coughs> we have two things. We also need a frame of reference, and then we need a geometry for the way that that thing is going to look. Right now we don't have colors yet. But we say, hey, so what I want to create now is a box, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 by 1. Yeah, but how do you put that box in, in with respect to the frame of reference? Because <coughs> When you create that box, something like this, 
The frame of reference is going to be in the middle. Well, actually, it's going to be placed, in this case, it's going to be in the middle because we created it uh, inside this URDF file. It was not created by uh, SolidWorks. Okay? So we have, we also have, uh, we have uh, the world link here. Yeah? That's going to be 0, 0, 0. Okay? So if this uh, frame origin is 0, 0, 0, we're going to take this frame of reference and put it exactly here. Yeah? And so the box kind of would be like this. Yeah? A part, it, it would be in the middle. So one, some part of it will be below zero, some part of it will be above zero. When we move the visual <coughs> frame 0 0.5 centimeters up, it's half the distance of this height. This is uh, maybe like length, width, height, something like that. So when we do that, we take this frame of reference and move it up by 0 0.5. So now the box kind of will be like this. Let me let me go over here. So now <coughs> that box kind of like would would be right at at the zero of the floor. The bottom of the box will be at zero. Here, the bottom of the box is at minus zero point five. Here, the bottom of the box is at zero. This is at one. Yeah, and then the middle of this is at 0 0.5. So we just shift the box up uh, in the visual frame. Okay, the way that the box looks. <coughs> now, right now we're not going to visualize the model yet. We're going to keep uh, adding a few more things, and at the end we'll start visualizing what these things look like. <coughs> Okay, I'm not going to go through this slide because I've just been explaining it. Yeah, but it basically says the same thing. <coughs> now let's look at the dynamic model. Uh, this is the first one we looked earlier. So let's let's look at that again. Joints and limits. Uh, links and joints. <coughs> What was the first one that we did? I'm making a mistake here. Links and joints that had all the inertia parameters. Guys, do anyone remember? We just looked at it. This one has that, and maybe it's this one. But earlier we, we looked at another one like that. Okay, let's look at this one. It's one link with mass. One link with mass. 
here we, we have the visual stuff uh, as before. Yeah, this is our visual frame move, moved up. Here we have the box size. <coughs> and then for this link name, link one, we have this inertial section. Okay? Just like the visual field, we also have a frame. We put it in the same place as the visual frame here. <coughs> we give a mass in terms of kilograms, one kilogram. And then we have this inertia. Let's look at what these values mean. Okay. <coughs> so this, this is a little bit of, about physics, but we care about the density, right? We care about the density. Does, is the density or the mass distributed equally across the object, yes or no? Is one side heavier or is everything about the same? Yeah? So if, the, if we have uniform density, then the, the center of mass is in the middle. Actually, this should not go here. Uh, actually, this is wrong. Let me see. Oh, this is, sorry, this is with respect to link one. It's zero in the x, zero in the, zero in the x, zero in the y, and 0 0.5 in the z direction. That's where the center of mass is. We're just saying it's going to be in the middle of, of the box. And this is with respect to, WRT means with respect to link one, right? <coughs> link one is the blue one. Yeah, and so it's going up by 0 0.5 in the z direction. Now, <coughs> we have something called rotational inertia. Yeah, the rotational inertia describes uh, the distribution of weight uh, for an object. Now, you need to study this personally if you don't remember. I include three or four videos on the next slide that give you examples of rotational inertia. But it, it discusses how mass is distributed in the object, yeah? <coughs> if we're looking at a three-dimensional object, <coughs> we have, we're doing an integral over the volume of the density, and then we have this matrix that changes depending on the shape of the object. If you have a, if you have a square, a rectangle, a cylinder, a wheel, then you have these kinds of different equations that help us to get an idea of the distribution of weight, okay? For example, this microphone, <coughs> the weight is not distributed evenly, right? Like this falls down like this, which means this side is heavier than this side, right? <coughs> uh, things like that. This, this battery, maybe this, <coughs> this rectangle might be distributed evenly. Maybe yes, maybe not, right? Things like that. So now this uses, we call this the tensor matrix, inertia tensor matrix. It's a three by three. Um, now if you notice, this is a symmetrical matrix. These two are the same, these two are the same. Um, let me see. This should be this. Uh, let, let me check. But this is a symmetric matrix. Normally, you uh, you have these nine values, but as long as you have the upper triangle, this triangle here, it's enough to fulfill everything else because of the symmetry of the matrix. I need to check this detail here. It looks different. Yeah. <clears throat> but if it's a symmetric matrix, you only need you don't need all the values because you can fill the other side of the triangle. Yeah? Uh, okay. So this is the density of the material. We want to, this is wrong. We want to integrate over the volume. Uh, oh, this matrix, uh, not this one, is always symmetric. The resulting uh, rotational inertia, not this one, uh, is symmetric. And then we only need six values. We don't need uh, all the values that come out here, the nine values. This is simple uh, to compute for common shapes. There's many tables that say, hey, this is how you do it. Uh, and then CAD programs like SolidWorks will compute this matrix automatically, right? Because the question is, uh, how do I compute these values? Uh, SolidWorks will do this automatically, uh, internally, okay? So these are some videos that show you examples of rotational inertia. Yeah, this is a very famous professor in MIT that teaches physics. 
He's retired, so that's a 40 minute class if you want to take a look at it <coughs> about rotational <coughs> inertia. <coughs> now, uh, the values of our rotational inertia i will change if the frame of reference changes. Okay? So that matters. And so the question is where is the inertial frame referred to in the URDF? It's always coincident with the center of mass. Okay? That frame of reference is going to be at the center of mass of the object. Center of mass. URDF can be a little bit complicated for things like this. A little, some of you are like, oh, what, I'm getting lost. Yeah, because there's a, a lot of things to be, to take care of. So, and when the robot becomes very big and complicated, there's a lot of things to consider. So you just got to be very careful. Uh, solid work kinds, CAD systems will help you a lot to take care of a lot of details. And then we'll learn something about Psycho that helps to make these things more manageable uh, and put them together. Uh, and then this also inertial frame of reference is convenient to align it with some axes. And here the axis is parallel to the link frame. So all, all what we're saying is here's the link frame. Here's uh, the object. We have an inertial frame. We're going to put it at the center of mass. And it's going to be parallel to the link frame. Yeah, it's going to be parallel to the link frame. So at the end, <coughs> this is the world. And then <coughs> we have this point. That's the link frame for the, uh, for the inertial property. It's at the center of mass. And it's parallel to the link frame. OK, it's parallel. So that's going to be convenient because uh, the transformation is just very easy. Yeah, so we do that. <coughs> Finally, uh, you need to try your best to approximate the values, even if you don't know them. Yeah, if, if you can't get them from, from SolidWorks, you need to try your best to approximate them. Do not use zero for the mass. Do not use zero for the diagonal <coughs> of the rotation, uh, rotation of inertia matrix. If you do that, then the physics engine would end up getting values that are infinity or zero. And, and you'll probably get a crash in, in the system. Yeah. <clears throat> so here we have one kilogram. And then we make diagonal elements equal to one. That's not realistic. Normally, these numbers will be smaller. <coughs> but it's OK for the demonstration. So now, even though it's boring, we have enough information to load into a simulator. Uh, yeah. So this file that we have here is very boring. But this would be enough to, to put into gazebo. Okay. Now before we visualize it, before we visualize it, let's put a movable link on top. Let's have two links. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> we now move to minimal robot description without collision. Same as before, we have the world and the link. Okay. Base link, okay, has this name. Here's the axes, here's the geometry. Then we have the inertial axes, the, the mass, the rotation of inertia matrix. You can see how this is described. We have one, two, three, four, five, six numbers. <coughs> this is the diagonal param parameters, IXX. IYY, IZZ, those are one. And these are the off diagonals, IXY, IXZ, and IYZ. Yeah, we just take the upper triangle, IXX, IXY, IXZ. And then IYY, IYZ, and IZZ. Yeah. <coughs> then <coughs> here's link two. <coughs> Uh, it's it's uh, visual uh, axes uh, will be at the same, 0, 0, 0 0.5. Why 0 0.5? 
not just to be the same as before, but here, instead of having a box, we're gonna have a cylinder. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> or oh, something uh, to note. <coughs> uh, well, let me see, no, one second. Geometry is a cylinder of length one and radius 0 0.1. Uh, but you should be asking, oh, in which direction is the cylinder pointing? In the x direction, and the y direction, and the z direction. Well, this is length two, and that depends on the joint axis, right? Which we'll see in a second. But this link two also has inertial properties. We set the inertial link here. Mass of one, and these values, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.005. Most of the time, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, these values will have more or less this magnitude, 0, 0, 005. I wonder, um, <coughs> in reality, how, how we define those values? You need to you need to you need to understand the material, the density, and and uh, and then you do the integrals. You follow the equation that I showed you before. Go back and look at the lecture, and you'll be familiar with that. <coughs> but it's not it's not the right time for me to explain all of that. Uh, but I gave you the reference, so you can look at it. Here's the joint. So joint one continuous link one link two. Uh, we're going to move this one meter above. Remember that uh, if we look at the base link, <coughs> how big is that? That is one, right? So we want to put the joint axes on top of that. And uh, no, no rotation. And then this is going to be 0, 1, 0, so it's pointing in the y direction, the joint axis. Then we put uh, link 2 on top of that. <coughs> and this cylinder, let's see. The axis of rotation of the cylinder. I'm not sure. Let's take a look here. <coughs> About uh, how this looks. Oh, here's here's. Uh, let me just add this. Uh, a few notes. Set the inertial frame at the center of mass. Mass one kilogram. Then these are the parameters. Because this is a cylinder, uh, we can use these uh, equations and the matrix that we looked at before. I x x and I y y can be one twelfth mass times the length squared. IZZ can be one half mass times the radius squared. <coughs> so those numbers that we're getting here, if you use mass equal to one, length equal to one, radius equal to 0 0.1, those are the, these are the, the values you're gonna get, right? So one times one, one, one squared is one, one divided by 12, uh, 0 0.08. Uh, here it just rounded off. And then you have uh, 1 times 0 0.1 squared, 0 0.001 divided by, 0 0.01 divided by 2, 0 0.005. Okay, so these equations are kind of, <coughs> and assuming we have uniform density, then you get these, kind of these numbers over here. <coughs> the joint frame. <coughs> Uh, which is also the frame of link 2. It's at the top of the re rectangle and it's parallel to the xy plane. Rotation axis set to the y axis. Here for inertial parameters, we could add friction properties using Coulomb friction or viscous friction. You can study the, those differences later. Uh, and we could also in introduce joint limits like my arm can only go from here to here, but not further than that. Those are joint limits. Torque limits means how much torque can the actuator apply? Like, I can push this hard, but I cannot push harder than that. So I have a torque limit. How strong is my motor? You can also apply that. <coughs> uh, <coughs> we're gonna visualize in a second the uh, collision model. A few, a few notes about collision. <coughs> the robot motion, the way that the arm moves, moves or the way that the mobile robot moves depends on also the forces and moments exerted on the robot. <coughs> Let's say I want to move forward one meter per second, but if someone hits me, I'm going to do this, right? 
my motion depends on external forces as well, gravity uh, and collisions. <coughs> the physics, when we say dynamics engine, <coughs> can also be physics engine, and forces, kinematic constraints, how link two moves with respect to link one, right? Like, it's, they're connected, they're not gonna get disconnected, yeah, you're, you're controlling that. And it enforces angular accelerations. For example, <clears throat> if I do this very fast with this joint, my arm will tend to want to keep moving in this direction, right? This has an effect on joint, uh, on link one, to do this a little bit. Yeah, if I do this a little bit, it's like my, and I don't stop it, everything begins to bounce, right? Because the force, there's forces created by this one that influence this one. Yeah, so those things are considered by the dynamics engines. Angular acceleration caused by gravity, joint torques exerted by actuators. Joint torque simply means the, the, the force, the rotational force of the motor, of the actuator, and collisions. <coughs> so to include the influence of contact forces, we need the, we must enforce a collision model. Okay, and uh, so let's open this one. Minimal robot description. <clears throat> so we have the same thing, base link, inertial, visual. Oh, let me see, let me skip that. Collision. Okay, so you have this part here. This is new, but this is our collision model. Just like visual, just like inertia, you also need a frame. We put it in the same place as everything else. Zero, zero, zero point five. Now, the collision model needs a geometry. This is like specific to the collision model. Okay, we have two links. Those two links will also have a geometry. Right now, we have very simple shapes. We have a rectangle, a box, and we have a cylinder, right? But if you think about Baxter or UR5 or uh, Atlas humanoid robot, <coughs> those links may have very complicated shapes, right? In the collision model, you can say, let me have a shape that is as complicated as the original one, or let me have something more simple, okay? In this case, we're gonna have the same thing box. So it's the same shape. We have the same parameters. This one we're making it a little bit smaller. I'll, I'll explain to you why in a second. So we have the same origin, we have the same geometry, and we almost have the same size. Okay? For the cylinder it's going to be exactly the same. We go down here to the child link. We have a uh, collision. Here's the origin, the same as before, and here's our cylinder, length one, radius 0 0.1. Exactly the same, okay? Now let me explain a few things that I've mentioned here. <clears throat> when do collisions occur? Collisions occur when solids intersect. So you have maybe a box here and a cylinder here. Imagine that your arm could keep going, keep going, keep going, and then they would touch here, right? There would be some kind of intersection Intersection. When there's an intersection, they collide. Let's say you have a cylinder here and a cylinder here. If you do this, boom. They touch, they intersect. Then there's a collision. <coughs> when they intersect, they create interaction forces and torques. Uh, at the point of contact. Here you may only have one point of contact. But maybe you have multiple points of contact with more complicated shapes. Yeah. <coughs> now something you need to know is that collision checking can be a computationally expensive process. Very expensive. Because actually the, the system needs to check collisions between all the lengths of the robot. Between this and this, 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 this, and, this. this and everything. Yeah? In general, I mean, there's better ways or smaller ways or more advanced ways to do things, but basically you're checking intersections between everything and everything. It's computationally 
expensive. So everyone is always trying to find how to make this a less computationally expensive process. <coughs> so let's say you have a really nice advanced uh, model for one of your links. Yeah? Instead, you might choose a very simple collision model. Yeah? Uh, for example, so if the visual model is compl a complex mesh, just choose a simple primitive that surrounds the mesh. A mesh uh, is created in a program like SolidWorks. It's a, it's a surface of triangles. Let's say you have some kind of surface like this. And in here, uh, uh, how can I do this? You might have a lot of triangles. And these triangles might be made of sub-triangles. Many of them. Yeah? And those triangles help you to create very smooth surfaces. You might have 10,000 of them to create a very smooth surface. That's called a mesh. So let's say that you have something like this, right? To simplify it in your collision model, you just say, hmm, let me approximate that mesh with a primitive object. Let me draw a cylinder around it. Yeah? It's a little bit bigger than the mesh, or it could be a little bit smaller, normally a little bit bigger. And it's not exactly the same, but it's enough that, you know, maybe you say there's a collision when you're here instead of here. But it, it simplifies the computation a lot. Instead of having 10,000 <coughs> points, you maybe have two parameters that describe the surface. Yeah? So if, if that's what we do, we have a complex mesh. Now, you can still choose, if you have a really powerful computer, maybe you say, I don't care, let me keep the, the mesh for the collision model, okay? If you have a simple visual model, then the collision model normally is going to be identical. There's one more thing that you need to be aware of, is that you need clearance between the links. Because if you have uh, like a cylinder here and a cylinder here, they might be touching at the joint. So then this might say, oh, they're always colliding. So you need a little bit of space here, especially when you rotate, so that they never touch so that they never touch here. So this effort here to, to make this lamp a little bit smaller is to, to say, oh, let's move that back uh, three millimeters. Yeah, or 30 centimeters, sorry, th 30 centimeters, so that they never touch. Okay, does that make sense? That's called clearance, joint clearance. <coughs> okay, so, uh, what, what time is it? Yeah. 12? Yeah, 12. Ah, so fast. <laughs> Let me tell you something. So in today's lecture, I gave you two PDFs. Tony, two PDFs. One PDF is what we're looking at right now. The other PDF is from uh, the past that I did. Gazebo, Ross Control, and Baxter. This has a lot of details about gazebo, okay? I better skip it for now, but it tells you just a lot of details about gazebo, a lot of details, okay? And then you come here to URDF and gazebo and some tools and things like that. You don't need to look at the whole thing, but look at least, at least the first section, okay? So gazebo is a 3D uh, physics, driven, physics engine simulator, right? And uh, Gazebo started with ROS, but now is independent of ROS. There's a package called Gazebo ROS that helps to connect them, but they are independent. Gazebo can be used independently of ROS. Yeah? Uh, quick example. If I just say Gazebo like this, I get this. But this is not connected to ROS. This is just Gazebo running by itself. Yeah? If I say... <coughs> If I say ROS run gazebo ROS, gazebo, yeah, that starts gazebo, but it's connected to ROS. So it means that gazebo right now is publishing topics and services to ROS. But I need to use gazebo ROS to do that. When you kill gazebo, you don't close this window directly. You, you kill this window over here. Why? Because actually gazebo has two sides. The front end and the back end. What does that mean? Yeah. 
You guys know? Sometimes gazebo will hang like that. You can say, hey, I, I want to find the process for the user called gazebo. Yeah? So you find this number, and then you can say kill that number, and then it kills the process. Sometimes it hangs. Okay? <clears throat> so here you need to know PS for process with gazebo as using rep on the pipe to get the process ID, and then you can kill it. Okay, uh, for example, if I say GC server, like this, GZ server, that starts the back end. Gazebo is a server. Yes, yeah, a client server uh, system. So right now the server is running. If I say GZ client, that opens up, yeah? I can introduce a shape here, yeah? And then I can kill the client, and then I can open the client, and it's still there, because the server hasn't died. The client is just the front end, the, for you to see it, yeah? But the server runs all the physics stuff, all right? So there's two sides to get see, well, the client and the server. All right, let's go back to this presentation. So we want to uh, start building a few things. The first thing we do is go to example models, rectangular prism. Okay, let me close a few windows. Raw CD uh, uh, example models, <coughs> rectangular prism. So here we have this uh, model 1.4 SDF. <clears throat> we can say roast run gazebo roast. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> here gazebo roast is the package, okay? And these things that you see up here are the nodes. Gazebo can be a node, but you also have spawn model. And so spawn model is a node that says you need to give me an argument. And that argument is the model. So you say spawn model. And if you look at the Gazebo tutorials, you'll see that there's uh, several options. Number one, you need a file. Uh, is it? Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, you need a file. And the name of the file is model-1-4-STF. And then uh, you need to say, what kind of file is this? Because it can be a URDF or it can be an SDF. In this case, it's an SDF model. So you give that flag. And then uh, you give the name of the model inside the SDF. Yeah? So we say the name of the model is rectangular prism. For example, if you don't remember, uh, we can say less this one. You see that model name right here is rectangular prism, right? So that's the name that we are including. This name is the name we're including here. Okay, so that's what you need to do if you want to load directly uh, with spawn model. So I press enter on that. Oh, I need a ROS core. And as soon as I do that, it says loading model XML from file. And I'm waiting for this. Let's see. ROS run. Let me try that again. Mm, doing something wrong here. Okay. Waiting for a service. It's mm, this is not loading properly. Anyone know what I'm doing wrong? Hmm? Well, 
maybe I need to start. This one. Oh, I need to open gazebo. I think I thought it would open it automatically, but it doesn't. <coughs> Let me uh, move this window over. Let me kill that. Uh, okay, so let me start this from the beginning. Kill that, kill that. So uh, let's do that again. You start with gazebo. I need to update my slide. <coughs> and then we're going to now, this word is imp important for you to become familiar with, spawn. Spawn is like load. Sl load a model onto, onto gazebo. So we do that, and then here it comes, okay? There it is. It's big. Also, this, uh, here it says real-time factor. Guys, you should be running it on your computers, yeah? You can run everything like this by yourselves. Yeah, it's, that real-time factor 1.0 means the time in the computer and the time in the outside world is the same. Yeah, when that number is 0 0.5, it would mean that the time in the simulation is twice as slow, or half of the real time, uh, compared to the thing. Because simulations can be intensive. Your computer may not be able to handle the computation so well. So the idea of time changes. Yeah, so the time factor is important. Uh, if I cancel this again, you can change how that model loads by in, in introducing XYZ coordinates. So here, uh, let's say, let me change that Z to 10. Yeah, so it's going to move that box, box up uh, by 10 meters. And then gravity brings it back to the floor. Gravity brings it back to the floor. Yeah, so you, you have things like that. Uh, now, you know, right now, in order for us to run this, we need to be in the right path. Because we're saying, I want to spawn this model, right? I want to spawn uh, model 1.4, 1.4SDF, right? So this is not very convenient that you have to like CD to a location to then load it. The next thing that we can do is uh, use ROS pack find. ROS pack find here in bold is a ROS uh, command that returns the path to a package. Yeah. So here, we, here for example, I could change to anywhere in my computer. I'm not in the right path, right? But I can still say, and let me restart Ross uh, Gazebo again. There's a, there's a reset command in Gazebo. That's probably what I should be doing. Uh, here, it's hanging again. When it does that, you need to kill it. Kill it. Yeah, so. Uh, PS, grab, Gazebo. Yeah, and then uh, this one. So I want, uh, uh, how can I know which one is the one I should kill? Both. Well, you need to know what it is. These are both process IDs. There's two of them. Now, that one died, so fine. You need to know what, what it means. So there are processes, processes that are run. OK, so now uh, I say rush run. Gazebo ROS, spawn model, file. But now I don't just say model 1.4 because I cannot find it. So I need to use money sign, parentheses, ROS pack find example models. And then I can give the relative path. Rectangle, prism, model uh, 1.4. So here, money sign means I want to get the value of a variable. ROS pack find, name of package. This is DX MPL models. That's going to return the path to that package. But then we want to go inside this folder, Prism, 
And then in this folder, we can find that one. Okay, so let's start gazebo and take a look. Press enter here. And if the path is correct, then you'll have no errors, okay? <clears throat> and even better is if we can then do this from a launch file, a launch file, right? So uh, we have this link uh, to this launch file. It's called add rectangular prism. Launch. This is. Let me see. At rectangular prism. Example models. Oh, add rectangular. Can you guys see it? Yeah, here. This one. <coughs> yeah, so we have uh, node name. This can be anything that you want. We have package, gazebo raws, spawn models. Now pay attention to this part right here. Arguments, yeah, it's a new field uh, for a launch file that you haven't seen. We say arguments equals quotes. And then we need to do the same thing we did before, file. Now here we don't say ROS pack find. Inside the launch file, we just use find. Yeah, find, example models, rectangular prism, model 1.4, SDF, Model name, rectangular prism, XYZ coordinates. Yep. And uh, this uh, launch file still has not uh, started ROS automatically, so we'll need to do that ourselves. Uh, let me see what did I do. I, there's uh, something strange in my computer because my other windows just disappeared. So, uh, Oh, this already running. Ross run, gazebo, Ross, gazebo. Uh, <coughs> something wrong in my computer. I recently updated my NVIDIA drivers, and I think it's messing, messing this up. Okay, I started gazebo, and uh, I need to then run this launch file. Ross launch, example models, add rectangular, prism.launch. So I run that, and then there it is, okay? So it's even better with the launch file, right? And the find command is, is very useful. Okay. And then we have, uh, maybe I'll skip this quickly, we have more advanced launch files. This one will take away the gravity, so things begin to float in the air. Yeah? And then we add a cylinder, like this one. Uh, so you can get several things. And this way you can spawn many things together. And so let's, let's launch this last one, add cylinder. Uh, where is reset? Uh, reset world, yes, just doing that. So let's do a uh, ROS launch. Example models and add cylinder. So this is gonna open two things, but now what I want you to see is that we can begin to interact with Oh, maybe I need to run the other one independently of this. 
Ross launch example models. Uh, okay, do something like this. Okay, so we're we're adding these two, and then <laughs> right now uh, Gazebo is interacting with Ross. So Gazebo is publishing topics, and it also has uh, service requests. <clears throat> so for example, I can say raw service list, remember? And look at all the stuff that we get. We get a lot of services that are being run by, by Gazebo. One that we really care about is called set model state. Now this is a service, so <coughs> this Gazebo set model state has a request and a response. The request, you need to send a, a model state. We'll see what that is. And the response will say, yeah, this is working or this is not working. Let's take a look. Uh, raw service info, gazebo, set, model, state. <clears throat> so the notice gazebo, uh, the type of this service, it's a gazebo messages set model state. Okay. <clears throat> you can look at that message using uh, raw service, uh, raw message, gazebo, or raw service. So state, what is Gazebo state? Well, in robotics, the word state is like all the information you can get from something. So this is an important word, right? Pose. Where is this thing? Where is the model? Based uh, on, the word, on its parent reference frame. You have a pose, position, orientation. You have a twist, linear, and angular, and you have a reference frame. <coughs> and then this says, you know, is this working okay? And some status message. <coughs> so with this, what can you do? You can move the model to a position, or you can give it a twist. Yeah, and gazebo. <coughs> So, we, again, we can do this using a manual method, or we can use a node, but we can say raw service call, gazebo, set model state, <coughs> and then in the service call, like just like public, uh, publishing a topic, we can say model state, model name, this thing, twist, angular, da da da. And what that's going to do, it's going to take the cylinder and rotate it around the z axis, right? And then we'll see that we can program these things in the node here. And run that node here. So let me do this manually real quick. <coughs> no, I can I need to do it by hand. Let's see. Raw service call. Gazebo set model state, then these, then these uh, model states, then these model name, rectangular prism, twist, then these angular, then these. See how I do it? You always have to finish the brackets first and then come back. Okay, let's run that. Uh, nothing happened, what happened? Maybe, let's see, let's say, twist, linear, Oops. It, I think I'm just doing it one moment, like one step, <clears throat> not not continually. So you can like I'm going to do it again, and you'll see it shake a little bit. Oh yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So if we do it in the node, uh, let's run that node real quick just to see it. 
<coughs> Rosh Ron, uh, example, Gazebo set state. Uh, example, Gazebo set prism state. Example. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, <coughs> kind of doing something like this. <coughs> now let's look at that code. <coughs> Real quick, uh, example is zero. So prism. So I won't spend a lot of time, but you need the gazebo messages for model state and set model state. We have some strings, standard input output, standard messages, some math. Okay, <coughs> and. Service ready. This line is key. So, <coughs> uh, checking if we have a service exists, yes or no, based on, on this service topic, this will be okay or false. And then, if it exists, it means Gazebo is running. Then you can create the client. So, service client, uh, here's the variable name. <coughs> you use the handle to get this. This is the type and then the topic, right? Now that we have the client, we need the message. So this is a model state. Remember that we have request and response. In request, we have model. <coughs> uh, and then we need to access all of those things. We can have the name, we can have the position, we can have the orientation, we can have the linear twist and the angular twist. Once you have that, you also set the reference frame to world and then you can send it over. So we, as before, hopefully you remember from last week, you say call, you send that message, um, and here you collect a response. So here you can collect it in results, and you say it didn't work or it did work. Okay, so this is a way to communicate with Gazebo. Okay, uh, like we'll stop here for today. Uh, next uh, week, I will continue uh, one or two more sections on this, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. The next section is introducing a controller into the simulation. Okay, right now we're still moving things manually, so the next is based on homework one that you did two weeks ago, how to introduce a controller. Anyways, we'll see that next week. Thank you. Uh, Dinesh is here today. Uh, tomorrow, but tomorrow we'll go visit some places so we will see them. Uh, look for them today. I don't know the steps. Things better. Probably. Let me sit closer. Okay, Bobby, I obey. Bobby, she is. Bobby, she is. Bobby, she is.